Hey, you saw that video title, and you know what that means. Your least favorite YouTubers here to talk about fall anime, with whatever garbage landed on my plate. And in order to get the cream of that garbage crop, I had to pick shows, so I used my usual method. Cross-referencing the names of shows with court documents, and whichever showed up as defendants in Texas court suing abortion clinics, were my winners. Yeah, probably a bad time to excuse my import taste and edgelord humor, but too late for that now. Anyway, I've got a hell of a roster. AK Monogatari steps into the modern day with a throwback to feudal Japan with clans warring over a girl's predictions. I didn't learn my lesson with Yakunata Mug Cut Mo, so uh, here's season two. Because sci fi is a plague this season, Mute King the Dancing Hero is about a kid fighting aliens while dancing. Miyaduko steps up to be our lighthearted ghost story this season, with a girl ignoring spooky shit and failing miserably. The Shonen Eye tag spoke to me once again, compelling me to grab Sankaku Mado no Sotogawa wa Yoru, where, uh, this time a guy sees ghosts. When your description says you're super original, you've already failed, and that's Tesla Note right there. Mushoku Tensei's second core is here, finally. If it's not science fiction this season, it's fucking vampires. And I'm picking up Tsukito Laikato Nosferatu this season. Okay, I lied, I'm also grabbing Madhouse's adaptation of Kyuketsuki Sugishinu. Tack Dopey Destiny is Mappo once again trying at listeners, but having Madhouse help this time. Let's hope that works out. Puta Ore Pride of Orange is our cute girls doing a sport this season, and it looks like it's ice hockey this time. Of course it is. Why wouldn't it be? What happens when an adventurer and a princess fuck off from the main plot to start a medicine store? Sorry, too lazy to read the whole name this time, so Shin no Nakama. That's what. Isekai still isn't done with my endless torment. This time with Sekai Saikyo no Ansatsusha, Isekai Kizoku ni Tensei Suru. About a hired killer being reincarnated as... another hired killer. The internet is ablaze with Komi-san wa Komisho Desu's long-awaited adaptation. Platinum End hits us with a suicidal teen meeting an angel. That seems redundant. I need some romance to vary this shit up, so how about a historical one set in pre-World War II Japan, with Taisho Otome Hotogi Banashi. Dogo Kobo gives us more comedy with Senpai ga Uzai Kohai no Hanashi, about a loud senpai annoying his hard-working kohai in an office. Yeah, Kimetsu no Yaiba Season 2, so this is your preempting to get hyped. Fuck me and my emotional damage by bringing all the key girls into one place with Kagi Nato, which I guess is just their attempt at Isekai Quartet. And lastly, Osama Ranking is about a deaf prince seeking glory. Well, we've got a packed roster, so let's dig in proper. First up is Heike Monogatari. This is an old story, like 1300s old and has been adapted countless times into different mediums. It's about the downfall of a prolific clan foretold by a Biwa player, as she's impressed the clan leader with her ability. Unfortunately, she sees a massive civil war on the horizon with a ton of death. It's a pretty basic story with mild mystical elements, but its classical roots are showing a bit with how abrupt everything is. Older stories really didn't need much to get the audience invested, and uh, this is barely trying. The girl's dad dying within the first few minutes and triggering her ability feels a bit lazy, with no real build-up. And a minor gripe, while I think Yuki Aoi is a talented voice actor, I'm getting kinda sick of her being in... everything. She's played multiple main characters each season now for all of 2021, like, give this girl a rest. But with Sai and Saru behind the wheel here, I'm at least a little optimistic from a visual standpoint. This is the studio that brought us a Zoken last year, and they're trying to capture traditional Japanese art in motion with this series. And I feel like it's succeeding. It's brimming with style, artistic motivation, and ambition to say the least, which is a massive positive. I'm not sure if this will be amazing this season, but it's starting on the better side of the spectrum at the very least. Check it out for some historical fiction with an artistic flair. Fuck me. I'm looking at Yakunata Mukka Mo season 2 this fall, and I'm practically gonna gloss over it because it's a case of last verse same as the first. Yeah, this is a somewhat niche slice of life story that tries to delve into the main character's insecurities by constantly comparing her to her dead mom. It's not doing anything more, so that means we're stuck with a glorified tourist pull sort of anime, with a mostly bland cast that only stands out in contrast to their bland co-stars. The question is, 
Do you like pottery? And Slice of Life, where the main character gets mood-shatteringly sad when she fails to the point that it feels out of place in the show? I don't. But I was dumb enough to watch Season 1 and feel compelled to talk about Season 2. Next up, we have a funky throwback dystopian monstrosity boiling over with 80s nostalgia. Mute King, the dancing hero. So the description of this is an absolute nonsensical mess, with a hero who fights aliens by dancing to pop music, and that's sort of part of the charm, by throwing all this insanity together and expecting it to stick. So does it? Yeah, sort of. The series throws a lot at you and just expects you to roll with it, but none of it's terribly important, so basically it's just saying to the audience to turn off your brain. It's cheesy, low-budget nonsense that doesn't take itself seriously, and could be something to get lost in for some dumb fun. The animation is a mess of styles with flat, simplistic characters that also have some over-designed aspects that feel like they're taking inspiration from older shows while adding more modern aesthetics. CG is pretty prevalent here, and while it stands out and doesn't look good, it fits with the kind of 80s cyberpunk cheese this anime is going for. I can't say this series will be good, but it's almost trying to be so absurd and bad that it might just come full circle. I'll keep an eye on this and see how it develops, but temper your expectations if quirky isn't enough to pull you through an anime. Just in time for the spookiest month, let's talk about some horror with Miyoko-chan, a show about a girl who was pretty normal until she got six sensed into seeing dead people, and uh, how that impacts her daily life by um, trying to ignore the scary shit but that doesn't work so well, and starts to impact her mentally. That sounds sort of interesting, since there's not many horror out this season, but what slaps me in the face is the comedy tag conspicuously tucked next to it. So the issue becomes, does this one distract from the other? Not really. They're pretty separate aspects of the show, where the comedy is the levity to contrast the darker elements with. Animation is sort of standard, can't really say it stands out in any aspect, which isn't necessarily bad, as long as the content is engaging to make up for the lack of visual excitement. It tries to add some weight to scenes with its direction by using close-ups and charring sounds, but that's more of a gimmick, and yeah, I guess that does lean into the horror roots, but that could easily vanish as the series progresses. This is by Passion, which does some polished work and can flex when a series calls for it, but we'll see if they can keep up this slightly above-average quality. It's kind of intriguing, and not so much scary as horror-themed. Check it out if you're in the mood for some grotesque imagery. Speaking of seeing spooky shit, uh, Sankaku Mado no Sotogawa wa Yoru, an average scaredy cat bookstore employee can see the supernatural and gets dragged into mystery solving with an exorcist. Sounds like your typical adventure setup, but um, he's a bit soon for the dude, so that's where our shonen eye tag comes in. Okay, yeah, that's an understatement. Mystery, drama, and romance with a dark twist? Yeah, sign me up. Though this first episode lays it on pretty thick. The dude's seeing ghost is introduced immediately with zero build-up, and the sort of semi-intimate relationship comes on super strong with barely any names exchanged. Also, the soul-touching thing feels good for them and just sort of comes off as creepy. Like, does he need to give consent to touch souls? I don't know. Maybe it's how it overtly sexualizes a fairly unsexual concept like exorcism that it comes off as uncomfortable like I'm being dragged along for the ride on a tour of someone's secret porn stash. That sort of feeling, get what I'm saying? The tone is overly dramatic at the start, while feeling too forward to justify it, so it doesn't take its time to get to the premise of the series, the exorcisms and relationship between the two leads, which is both refreshing, but also jarring. That may sound like I don't like it, but that's not the case. I'm just not entirely sold on the story yet. Animation is really hard to place here, as it looks presentable, but doesn't exactly stand out. The action and framing are competently dumb without trying to be too well executed that this series feels like it'll fall apart in a few episodes as this is what the studio is trying to focus on looking good. You know, as they do at the start of most shows, it's hard to recommend this series because, well, it's awkward. But it also might be a metaphor for sexual experimentation in the grand scheme of things, so, uh, recommend it for people into that? I guess. Originality died this season with Teslano, where a girl raised as a ninja to be a spy teams up with another spy to find Elon Musk's next stolen invention before other countries do. Sound interesting? I'd hope not. 
because it looks like a mess of ideas thrown together for a generic spy thriller plot, just with some added anime battles. That's two levels of paper thin plastered together, but I'm sure that and the random word generator of popular terms on the internet used to create the rest of this mess will somehow come together to create a cohesive plot. The story just sort of happens, with the main cast being pulled in because they were the designated main characters on duty. We're all super amazing, but realistically wouldn't be chosen for this. Sorry high schoolers, you don't get to be spies because you know a few languages and can run really fast. So it fails on that front too, that being getting me invested. But that's not all. I'm sure some of you are wondering how that my anime list rating got so low. Well, probably the abysmal animation. Using low poly 3D background models that don't blend at all with the other 2D background art, shitty hyper polished shading that makes them look plastic, confusing cuts, unfocused camera, and stilted movements, only put this marginally better than X-Arm. That's a low bar to clear. Sorry, that's harsh criticism, but the fact that this series makes no effort to blend its two styles means it looks like a hodgepodge of elements with an already cluttered mess of a plot. If this stuck to 3D and didn't use awful motion capture, it probably would have looked better. Which is a shame, because the main character models are actually decent looking and could pass for a decent amateur web project if left in isolation. Or like a budget JRPG, one of those two. Want something to laugh at this season? This is it. Otherwise, it's a hard pass. God, I need something decent to wash that taste out of my mouth. And I don't even care if it's an isekai, so look what's next. Mushoku Tensei Season 2 is here to be more of the same. What were my thoughts on that? Well, it was a well-executed adaptation of an older isekai franchise that cemented why the genre gained popularity by showcasing how the tropes that defined isekai are meant to be done. A sort of personal redemption arc for the protagonist as he goes from a worthless neat traumatized by bullying in high school, dies doing a good deed, and is reincarnated into a fantasy world where he has to overcome the problems that defined his previous life, while living up to everything he ever wanted to be. And uh, that's what an isekai should be about. A fresh start to be a better person. So season 2 is continuing where the first left off, or rather a year after. And you should probably catch up on the first season if you held off for whatever reason. Next up is the first in our vampire double feature with Tsuki to Laika to Nosferatu. In an alternate reality where the Cold War is in full swing, space is the next territory to conquer. So with our Soviet Union substitute being the focus, the first human in space is actually a vampire. We follow a guy and his vampire waifu as he trains her to get into space, while the two share a genuine bond while both wanting to go to the moon. Or, I guess at least space. And, um, this plot is sort of strange. Like, I don't know who thought, let's do the space race during the Cold War, but with vampires. But it's certainly a unique spin. So, vampires a bit of a misnomer in this sense, as they don't actually drink blood and can go out during the daylight. But they just get heat stroke easily. So she's not quite human and is just an experiment to see if humans can survive in space. Period. Meaning there's a reason their relationship needs to progress through the series, as there's hurdles. And I like that, as it gives both characters motivations and obstacles to overcome. Animation isn't anything to write home about, to the point I uh, almost forgot to mention it. But it's entirely invisible in terms of style and direction, so at least it won't distract from the offbeat premise. Hard to say if this is worth a watch, as it promises a lot, but doesn't deliver. But also isn't entirely boring with what it is offering. Want a love story set in Soviet Russia about two people who are fighting to accomplish their dreams, despite that probably not happening for either of them? And this might be worth a look then, I guess. So since the last one promised vampires, and we got what amounted to a light case of albinism, Madhouse's adaptation of Kyuketsuki Sugushinu comes next. It's about the progenitor of all vampires living in the modern world. The joke here is that despite him being the father of all vampires and said to be invincible, he's super weak and dies a lot, but resurrects infinitely. Yeah, when a vampire hunter finds him, he actually kills him by accident, just by hitting him with the door he opened. It's that sort of comedy. They end up blowing up his mansion and leaving him with no place to go, so he ends up crashing with the vampire hunter and gets wrapped up in helping, so the two of them solve vampire-related cases. Honestly, the simplistic rounded art style and flat shading, over-the-top deliveries, and fast-paced humor throwing jokes at you in quick succession, while running the gag of dying endlessly into the ground immediately, gives us a certain charm that most other comedies lack. 
But then again, maybe it's just Fukuyama Juna's draw look that sells this, since it's basically Lelouch from Code Geass's panache, with absolutely nothing backing it up. This was good for a laugh, so it's got a recommendation, even if it might get a bit old later down the line. Well, let's see if MAPPA can redeem themselves with the original anime music monster fight shtick that's apparently a genre now, with Tactopi Destiny. So in a post-apocalyptic future where a meteor hit Earth releasing a bunch of monsters that banned music because that was their one weakness, a group of girls called Music Arts team up with conductors to fight them with scores. This is all told to the audience through an in-universe storybook, which lines up the premise well and in a visually interesting way. But this is basically musical magical girls where songs power their abilities and allow them to fight the invading alien menace which is at least cool and stylistically motivated. Even breaks in the action pack in personality for the cast, giving us snippets of who they are and their relationship dynamics without dumping it all on us in exposition. I'm vibing off this, because it's not like MAPPA's last music show where it was just a bunch of song and artist references for the sake of it, but this takes a larger look at music as a whole instead of just classic rock while also adding weight to artistic expression in the human experience. You know, why music is important to us as humans? Animation for this is pretty damn solid, as you'd expect with two powerhouse studios behind it, mixing great direction, detailed layered scenes, amazing attention to minor motions to sell character, and stellar fight scenes that are kinetic, as well as composed well, giving action weight. This one's good from the start, but whether it will keep that up isn't certain, but it does have a lot of potential and is going in the right direction. Recommended for a look. Oh no, the commercial break. I feel it in my bones, it's coming. Or maybe it didn't. Only you'll know for sure. Did you miss your fix of cute girls doing a sport thing? Because Puta Ore, Pride of Orange, has you covered. With a group of middle school girls aiming to be national champs in... ice hockey of all things. Though it sort of spoils the climax of the series a bit with a flash forward right off the bat, with the girls fighting Canada in the World Championship. I think this show loses focus by breaking into an idle routine after the game, but that's probably just me finding it comical and surreal. Maybe lack of focus is just the main theme here though, because it takes forever to even really get into the ice hockey, as these characters are spending time in an unrelated club, slacking off, and just indulging in the cute girls doing things aspect. While that does get us introduced to our core cast, I'd rather it do that by not being separate from the main premise. And no, I don't think that's asking too much. Oh, turns out the idol thing isn't a joke. It's their victory lap when they win. Hey, C2C, you guys have enough clout in the industry by this point. You could probably have done an idol show if you wanted to without bringing in hockey. Anyway, the animation here is on the lower end for the studio, being stiff and mostly close-ups. The reason why is they probably blew their budget on the first few minutes of the series and had to stretch the rest thin to compensate. I can't see this turning out good because it's suffering from an identity crisis. Probably give it a pass unless you're into idols, hockey, and slice of life anime. Sadly, those three things probably have enough of an intersection to give this an audience. Back into I Can't Believe It's Not Isekai for a sec with Shin no Nakama, where a guy got kicked out of the hero party before fighting a demon lord, told them to go screw themselves as he fucked off to go sell herbs in the countryside, and a princess he knows shows up because she couldn't handle all the drama, I guess. Is this basically the same thing as Drugstore from last season, minus the superfluous isekai aspect? Well, on paper they sound similar, but no, not really. It has a well done, if not a bit standard introduction to the world, by peppering in bits of character interaction into the exposition dump, letting the relationships develop while telling us flat out about the world and places we're seeing. I think it's taking the retired hero slice of life approach more seriously, as the main character tries to move on from his emotional baggage, and that's not a bad route to take here, which means I like it on that level. Animation is nothing special, almost painfully plainly presented. Nothing really stands out, but isn't bad enough to say, hey, this is the best they could do, and it sucks. So is this worth watching? For a slower paced fantasy series not trying to be funny? I'd say it is. It's got some charm, and a story worth telling. I was feeling a bit lucky there for a while, being able to avoid Isekai and all, but Sekai Saikyo no Ansatsusha just had to show up, didn't it? Earth's top assassin dies when he stepped on too many toes, and is reincarnated to live how he wants in a fantasy world, 
Only one catch. He has to kill the hero first. So he's now a noble in a family of assassins. And cue your typical isekai bullshit from there. What's different? It's a little more modern fantasy with guns and dress attire from recent history instead of robes, swords, and armor. Plus, the guy getting reincarnated is an older guy who's actually a grizzled badass, and not some super prodigy filled with anime and manga knowledge to be relatable. We spend a good amount of time with the dude learning about who he is. So, props there. Animation's sort of whatever, though, with a static camera so the scenes don't look too good, but it's not like every anime can be amazing. Though this is Silverlink, they generally have the ability to do that if they wish. I'm impressed with the visuals, but the story has piqued my interest. So we'll see where it goes from there. Let's look at Komi-san, since it's one of the anime that has people hyped this season. Basically Hitori Bochi, but in high school. The main girl, Komi, wants to make friends with kids in her class. But she can't due to crippling social anxiety. The problem is, everyone mistakes her as being too cool for school, but puts her on a pedestal. That is, until her new classmate, Tadano, learns what her deal is and tries to help her get over her issue by making friends. Hilarity ensues. The comedic timing here is on point, selling its jokes through interrupted dialogue, abrupt shifts in background, and other quirks to get a laugh by highlighting what makes the situation comical. And, uh, explaining why jokes work sort of ruins them. You know, it has different styles. Something's bound to stick for you. Plus an emotional heart that captures what it means to have social anxiety, as portrayed that she can spill her heart out in writing on a chalkboard, but not in words. Animation for this is pretty damn great though. Fluid movements, nice scene layering, great use of color, interesting angles that tell a story. It checks all my boxes. Looks real nice and packs energy. So it's already standing out this season. Check it out for a good comedy that can also hit in the feels. Platinum End is next with a pretty damn absurd plot. So Kid's parents die, which leaves him in the care of some abusive relatives, and that makes him depressed. On the night of his middle school graduation, he tries to kill himself, but is stopped by a girl who says that she's his guardian angel. Well, it's kinda hard to debate that, since she has wings and nobody can see her. She gives him some special powers, and says that he needs to kill 12 other god candidates to become the new god. So now he's got himself a little mission. Hooray. I think the first episode's a bit dramatic in its tone. And that probably sounds obvious since it's about a kid trying to kill himself, but it rushes its premise to get to the quote-unquote good stuff, so everything feels over the top and thus undersells the series. I'd love to have seen what led the guy to that point before seeing him try to off himself within the first minute. Even just some passing lines, bullying, or praying at his parents' grave before heading off to do it. It's all very unceremonious, and the order in which it's told almost feels like a joke. Besides, the violence and upbeat Murder Happy Angel don't really dissuade that impression. Also, I'm getting some serious Death Note vibes from the premise. Oh, it's by the same creator. That might explain it. Artwork is a bit bland too, landing on the mediocre side of the spectrum with basic designs, color, and such, but almost no use of movement, action, or camera. Lots of straight cuts to the next scene that pulls urgency out of the anime. I'm not impressed by this first episode, and have a feeling it'll fall flat by the end. Since I get enough depressing shit from my daily life, let's look at something a little less dreary. With Taisho Otome Otogi Banashi, a story about a rich kid who lost his mom, his arm, and his father's favor in one fell swoop. Now he's been sent to live in the countryside and wallow in his own despair, until a girl shows up at his doorstep and says she's been sent there to be his bride. The two now experience their first love in the quaint boonies of Taisho era Japan. This is a period we don't see touched on too often in anime. A weird time before World War I, where Japan was quickly modernizing and seeing a massive economic boon as imperialism took hold. I love the clash of 1920s cars, dress, and technology, with older housing, wardrobes, and mentalities before modernization, so seeing how this plays out is something to look forward to. The cast is a bit basic, but works, with a pessimistic guy being cheered up by an optimistic girl and the two look cute together. On its art, it stands firm, with a nice color palette that switches as soon as the main characters meet, from dingy muted tones in an old film overlay to soft, warmer colors. The line work is simplistic, but matches the nature of the story, that being two people falling in love. There's also a nice musical through line with the background piano and the main girl singing that persists. And that's a nice choice, I like it. So check it out if you're looking for a cute rom-com. 
Next, let's keep that comedy flowing with Senpai Ga Uzai Kohai no Hanashi. This is about two adults working in an office where the girl is fairly new at the company, looks younger than she actually is, and this big loud dude annoys her by treating her like a kid. But does he annoy her? They spend a lot of time together, and his overbearing personality might have wormed its way into her heart. Eh, too bad the Corona Scare soaked up all the deworming pills. Yeah, it's your typical case of opposites attract, and there's no way this relationship will work in real life. This is an anime, however, and those of us with shipping goggles can see what's really happening here. Big muscle headed jock with a spunky little girl about half his height who'd probably get mistaken for a middle schooler if not at her workplace. And that joke gets kind of old fast. But luckily, the rest of the cast varies it enough to not get stale. The saving grace here, his antics aren't malicious and she does like his compliments despite how they're delivered. And while she wants to get in his pants, he more sees her as like, a daughter figure? So there's a hurdle to overcome. Hence why this appeals to shippers since they do have chemistry. I can't really say much about the animation as it's competent, but doesn't do much to stand out. With such a short protagonist, we're stuck using wide shots to fit her in frame. And you know, that could be a vehicle for interesting shot choices or even visual comedy. But the series plays its premise a little too straight to have that sort of fun. A passable comedy with enough shipping bait to be the main draw, to keep people watching, myself included. Adjust your hype levels one more time for Kimetsu no Yaiba's second season. Just kidding, they're milking this hard by rehashing the movie into a seven part miniseries before actually launching the second season. Not much to really say about this since it follows up on the two core anime and literally retelling the arc from the movie. But having read the manga, this is a frame for the series moving forward by establishing a hierarchy of power. We saw in the first season what the lower moons could do and how strong they were, but what about the legendary upper moons, huh? For animation, UFO Table continues to do a great job at this series, and that's about all I can say. It looks good and has style. Watch if you didn't bother with the movie. If you did, uh, wait until the next arc comes out in December. Moving on. He's coming back onto the scene with some nostalgia bait to kick us in the fields with Kagi Nato, where they're digging up the corpses of Clannad, Cannon, Air, Little Busters, Rewrite, and other franchises for a chibi crossover series. Sorry, that may have been a bit too literal. Or rather, they're spitting on your emotions by turning the pivotal moments of these beloved franchises into jokes. Despite KyoAni doing most of these franchises, and arguably making Key into the anime hot property they are, Lead-In Films is doing this one? You're not fooling me by sticking this on your Kyoto division, Lead-In. I'm on to you. Not that the staff here isn't familiar, as the director worked as a key animator, episode director, and storyboarder for many of the franchises in question here. But the question hanging over this is, is it good? Well, that's hard to say. These franchises are known for their cute girls being adorable little balls of a singular character trait, mired by a tragic backstory reveal that makes the audience fall for them, and this strips a lot of that out for just cute slice of life nonsense and jokes. Almost at that conceit's expense. And yeah, the slice of life stuff works, but I can't really say it's worth a watch besides the spectacle of seeing these characters together. The cast is all pretty much the same, as these worlds are populated by airheaded moe blobs, so you're not getting the same impact as other crossover franchises like Isekai Quartet, where the draw is seeing the clashing personalities. For fans only, pretty much. Lastly, let's take a look at Osama Ranking, a pretty simple story about a powerless deaf prince who's first in line to become king. But there's one problem. People talk about him behind his back because of his ineptitude. But with his dream to be the greatest king and his new friend, an assassin named Kage, a literal talking shadow who steals from him, but can also understand the prince, we follow him through this coming of age story as he matures. This reeks of childhood innocence and a nice naivety that makes this sort of wholesome. The art helps it on that front by being so storybook inspired, but it really sets the tone for a story about growth with a goal in place and a main character who's ready to reach it. Hell, the main character having a barrier to communication adds an interesting obstacle for the story to explore. And it, uh, actually does that. This series is fun and has a positivity I've been sorely lacking this season. I've already touched on the thematic art, but the animation on top of that makes this stand out as special with a ton of work put into dynamic movements and a nice flow to actions. There's a bounciness to characters reminiscent of classic animation, and how the cast interacts with backgrounds plays into that as well. Check this out for a series that's brimming with personality. Well, falls shaping up to be... bland? 
A few shows have promise, but it's just that. A few. But what will tip from being mediocre to actually enjoyable, we'll see in the weeks to come. I just can't say I'm too optimistic. If this season has anything going for it, it's at least got a variety of interesting premises to squander. But let me know what you're interested in down in the comments below. I'd love to see them. Anyway, that'll be it for me. You've made it to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and do all the other YouTube stuff to help the channel grow. You can also join my Discord with a link down in the description. And if you really want to support me, you can head on over to my Patreon and pick up some extra perks, like voting on what I do next, as well as picking what I watch each season. And speaking of Patreon, I'd like to give a special thanks to Nadeshiko for their continued support. Thanks for watching.